Good morning. This is the third Sunday after Trinity morning prayer. Our opening hymn is number 151. Awake, my soul, and with the sun thy daily stage of duty run. Shake off dull sloth and joyful rise to pay thy morning sacrifice. Redeem thy misspent moments past and live this day as if thy last. Improve thy talent with due care for the great day thyself prepare. Let all thy converse be sincere, thy conscience as the noonday clear. Think how all seeing God thy ways and all thy secret thoughts surveys. Wake and lift up thyself, my heart, and with the angels bear thy part, who all night long unwearied sing I praise to the eternal King. The hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. Grace be unto you in peace, from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people being penitent the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all those who truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, 
and show ourselves glad in him with songs. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth, and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, let the whole earth stand in awe of him. For he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth, and with righteousness to judge the world and the peoples with his truth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Psalm 145. I will magnify thee, O God, my King, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Every day will I give thanks unto thee, and praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and marvelous worthy to be praised, there is no end of his greatness. One generation shall praise thy works unto another, and declare thy power. As for me, I will be talking of thy worship, thy glory, thy praise, and wondrous works, so that men shall speak of the might of thy marvelous acts, and I will also tell of thy greatness. The memorial of thine abundant kindness shall be showed, and men shall sing of thy righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, long-suffering and of great goodness. The Lord is loving unto every man, and his mercy is over all his works. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints give thanks unto thee. They show the glory of thy kingdom, and talk of thy power, that thy power, thy glory, and mightiness of thy kingdom might be known unto men. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all ages. The Lord upholdeth all such as fall, and lifteth up all those that are down. The eyes of all wait upon thee, O Lord, and thou givest them their meat in due season. Thou openest thine hand, and fillest all things living with plenteousness. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, yea, all such as call upon him faithfully. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will help them. The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but scattereth abroad all the ungodly. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh give thanks unto his holy name forever and ever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Here beginneth the 31st chapter of the book of the prophet Jeremiah. 
At the same time, saith the Lord, will I be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus saith the Lord, the people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness, even Israel, when I went to cause him to rest. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Again I will build thee, and thou shalt be built, O virgin of Israel. Thou shalt again be adorned with thy tabrets, and shalt go forth in the dances of them that make merry. Thou shalt yet plant vines upon the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant, and shall eat them as common things. For there shall be a day that the watchmen upon the Mount Ephraim shall call, shall cry, Arise ye, and let us go up to Zion unto the house of the Lord our God. For thus saith the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations, Publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save thy people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country, and gather them from the coasts of the earth, and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child, and her that travaileth with child together, a great company shall return thither. They shall come with weeping, and with supplications will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him, as a shepherd doth his flock. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob, and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, and shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord, for wheat, and for wine, and for oil, and for the young of the flock, and of the herd. And their soul shall be as a watered garden, and they shall not sorrow any more at all. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, both young men and old together, for I will turn their mourning into joy, and will comfort them, and make them rejoice in their sorrow. And I will satiate the soul of the priests with fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord. Here endeth the first lesson. The Te Deum. Mm -hmm. We praise thee, O God, we acknowledge thee to be the Lord. All the earth doth worship thee, the Father everlasting. To thee all angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To thee cherubim and seraphim continually do cry. Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth, Heaven and earth are full of the majesty of thy glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise thee. The goodly fellowship of the prophets praise thee. The noble army of martyrs praise thee. The holy church throughout all the world doth acknowledge thee. The father of an infinite majesty, thine adorable true and only son, also the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. Thou art the King of glory, O Christ. Thou art the everlasting Son of the Father. When thou tookest upon thee to deliver man, thou didst humble thyself to be born of a virgin. When thou hast overcome the sharpness of death, thou didst open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Thou sittest at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. We believe that thou shalt come to be our judge. We therefore pray thee, help thy servants whom thou hast redeemed with thy precious blood. Make them to be numbered with thy saints in glory everlasting. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine heritage. Govern them and lift them up forever. Day by day we magnify thee, and we worship thy name ever, world without end. Vouchsafe, O Lord, to keep us this day without sin, 
O Lord, have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us. O Lord, let thy mercy be upon us as our trust is in thee. O Lord, in thee have I trusted, let me never be confounded. Here beginneth the fifth verse of the fifth chapter of the first epistle general of St. Peter. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Here endeth the second lesson. The Benedictus. Mm -hmm. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a mighty salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our forefathers and to remember his holy covenant, to perform the oath which he sware to our forefather Abraham that he would give us, that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people for the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us pray. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us and grant us thy salvation. O God, may clean our hearts within us and take not thy Holy Spirit from us.
O Lord, we beseech thee mercifully to hear us, and grant that we, to whom thou hast given an hearty desire to pray, may, by thy mighty aid, be defended and comforted in all dangers and adversities. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries. Through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by thy governance, may be righteous in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning. Just a few announcements before we get into the homily today. Um, this Wednesday is the first Wednesday of the month, and that is our diocesan day of prayer and fasting. Um, we've In Corona Tide, we've kind of forgotten about that diocesan custom. The bishop called me a few weeks ago and said, are we still doing that? I said, yes, yes, sir, we still are. So um, Wednesday, July 1st, we do have our diocesan day of prayer and fasting. Um, and that's especially important in this time of pandemic and civil unrest and um, the other various tensions going on in our society today. So please do uh, continue to pray. Um, that's a good opportunity to pray the litany as well while you, um, while you do your fasting. Um, don't forget, we do have our Wednesday night class. Um, the, Zoom, the Zoom invite goes out through the announcements, and um, that does get recorded as well. And then um, do be, if, if, you're, if you have not been getting the announcements, do send me an email at fatheristic at allsaintsanglican.net, fatheristic at allsaintsanglican.net. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So for the last several weeks, I've mentioned that Trinity Tide is the season that focuses on our sanctification and on our growth in virtue as we battle vice and build virtue in our walk with the Lord. So the first two weeks of the season built the foundation based on God's love for us. That is, we get nowhere in our sanctification unless we are those who are first loved by God and then learn to love God and our neighbor in response, including that love with action, as we discussed last week. Well, today, the third Sunday after Trinity, we pick up our spiritual weapons and move on to the battlefield. The first enemy that we will battle is the age-old foe of pride. So please turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter 5, beginning at the fifth verse, 1 Peter 5, 5, and you can find this on page 192 in your prayer book. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. So when discussing the problem of pride, from the get-go, from the beginning, we encounter the problem that the English word pride has a wide range of meanings. When St. Peter says, God opposes the proud, God resisteth the proud. Does pride in this sense mean the same thing as when I say that I'm proud of my daughter for what she's done in one of her classes, or when a carpenter takes pride in making a high-quality piece of furniture? So we need to properly define our terms if we're to understand what God's Word is telling us here. While we do from time to time see the Old Testament use a word that gets translated into English as pride, which connotes dignity, the New Testament gives us three main concepts with three different words that get translated as pride. So first, we have a pride that speaks to loftiness or high-mindedness. 
The Old Testament version of this can also speak to majesty or to glory. But in the New Testament, we're generally talking about people who are metaphorically standing taller than they ought to stand. So in Romans chapter 11, St. Paul uses this sense of pride when he tells the Gentile Christians not to be proud in relation to the Jewish unbelievers who were cut off from the branch for their unbelief. Rather, the Gentiles are to realize that their belief is only by God's grace. Second, we have a pride that speaks to boastfulness or something of which one has cause to boast. This is the pride that St. Paul speaks of in Romans chapter 15 when he says, in Christ Jesus then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. This kind of pride can be a good thing but even then, we realize that it causes, its causes ultimately come from Christ. Christ is the source. Christ is the source for this kind of pride. Our pride, our boasting is really in Christ, not in ourselves. And then finally, we have a pride that is arrogance or haughtiness. And that's the sense of pride used in our epistle passage, our second lesson from 1 Peter today. In classical Greek literature, this kind of pride was sometimes called hubris, wherein a person exalted himself above the gods. For example, in one of the Greek myths, a wicked king named Salmoneus, in his pride, develops a machine to make thunderclaps, and then he orders his subjects to worship him as if he were Zeus. And consequently, he is severely punished by Zeus and the other gods. Even the pagans, we find out, realize that one ought not to have excessive pride before divinity. If we look at some of the other passages of scripture where this same Greek word is used, we can see how this, how this concept of blasphemous hubris is attached to this kind of pride. So in Luke 1, 51, in the Magnificat, the Song of Our Lady, one of the canticles that we sing every evensong, the Blessed Virgin Mary sings that God hath shown strength with his arm, he hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. In Romans 1, chapter, or chapter 1, verse 30, when speaking of people who rejected God and then were given up to a debased mind, St. Paul describes them as slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, same word in Greek, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 2, when St. Paul is speaking of the godlessness of the last days, he says, For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy. So in all of these things, we see that the arrogant, haughty kind of pride described in today's epistle is antithetical to a life that is united to Christ. You can't have a life united to Christ if you're harboring this kind of pride in your heart. Fourth century monk John Cassian, who helped introduce the communal style of monasticism, wrote the following about pride. He writes, there is then no other fault which is so destructive of all virtues and robs and despoils a man of all righteousness and holiness as this evil of pride, which is like some pestilential disease, attacks the whole man and, not content to damage one part or one limb only, injures the entire body by its deadly influence and endeavors to cast down by a most fatal fall and destroy those who are already at the top of the tree of the virtues. So in whereas other sins and vices attack just one virtue, pride, we see, attacks all the virtues. This is the very sin that caused Lucifer's fall from being one of the chief archangels to becoming Satan, the chief of the devils. So with all that in mind, we can indeed see why God resisteth the proud, as our verse says. But it also says that God gives grace to the humble. The Greek word translated in this passage as humble speaks to being lowly, undistinguished, of no account. 
and it's usually used in a derogatory manner in other Greek literature. In fact, humility often causes one to lose face in Greco-Roman society. Nevertheless, throughout the New Testament, God values humility in his people. So consider, for example, the following verses. Again, we can look to the Magnificat, Luke 1, uh, verse 52, uh, where our Lord's mother says, He hath put down the mighty from their seats, and hath exalted the humble and meek. Or we have our Lord's invitation to the would-be disciples in Matthew 11, verse 29, He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Or we have St. James' exhortation to his flock where he says, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. Because you see, throughout the New Testament, Christians are called to a humility that does not come natural to human beings. We're called to a humility that is countercultural. Yes, we are called to a humility that is supernatural. In the next verse of our epistle, we see some of the reasoning behind this calling. So let's look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. So rather than exalt ourselves with haughtiness, arrogance, or hubris, we're to humble ourselves before God and then let God do the exalting. So with his characteristic turn of phrase and bluntness, the reformer John Calvin has this to say about these verses. He says, We are to imagine that God has two hands, the one which like a hammer beats down and breaks in pieces those who raise them up themselves, and the other which raises up the humble who willingly let down themselves and is like a firm prop to sustain them. Were we really convinced of this, he writes, and had it deeply fixed in our minds, who of us would dare by pride to urge war with God? But the hope of impunity now makes us fearlessly to raise up our horn to heaven. Let then this declaration of Peter be as a celestial thunderbolt to make men humble. This is a good caution, and it speaks to the problem with pride. Who of us, he says, would dare by pride to urge war, to wage war with God? We do indeed need a true godly humility. But if we're honest, we all know what it's like to be arrogant folks who have a false humility, a feigned lowliness. And isn't that just another form of pride? In fact, you may have heard the term humble brag. Um, It's kind of a a more relatively modern meme where a person disguises a boast with with false modesty. It's not really humility. It's really bragging described as humility. True humility, on the other hand, comes from realizing our true state before God and before each other. We realize that we do need God to sustain us. In our collect, for example, we see a humble prayer that recognizes our need not only for God's mighty aid from all dangers and adversities, but also our our need for God to supply the desire to pray in the first place. Not only does he give us mighty aid in all the dangers, but we pray for him to give us the desire to pray. We also see humility illustrated in the traditional gospel lesson from today, um, which is the parable, uh, one of the parables Jesus tells in uh, Luke chapter 15. The passage begins with Jesus losing face inside of the religious leaders and other important people of society because he received sinners and ate with them. Jesus responds to their criticism by telling two parables about the rejoicing that comes when a sinner repents. And again, you can find this at the beginning of Luke chapter 15. Because you see, repentance always requires humility. Those two parables, by the way, are the, um, 
the parable of the lost coin and uh, the parable of the lost sheep. And in, in, then followed in the chapter is the parable of the prodigal son, which is not in our gospel reading, traditional gospel reading, but a lot of people do um, bring it on in because they really do go together. So what we see is that repentance always requires humility. Repentance always requires us to see ourselves as we really are and then to put aside pride, arrogance, and hubris because there are no humble brags before God. But also notice at the beginning of the passage in Luke chapter 15, we see that Jesus was willing to humble himself to eat with the sinners. Jesus put aside his glory and humbled himself to become one of us, to live in perfect obedience and submission to his Father, even to the point of suffering and dying for the sake of those whom he had created from the dust. He became like us who were from dust to save those who he created from the dust. This is, of course, a big part of our call to humility. We're following in Jesus' footsteps. Just as he was exalted when he rose in a glorified body and then ascended to the right hand of the Father, so too will we be raised in glory and brought before his throne. But in the meantime, we cast our cares and our anxieties on Christ, for he cares for us. It's true that humility is not really valued before the world. Sometimes, if we're humble, we may get taken advantage of. We may be seen as foolish or weak in the world's eyes. But Jesus can shoulder that burden. We know his love. We know that the cost of discipleship in this world is no match for the glories and joys of the world to come. This learning of humility is, of course, a process. This is something that we need to pray for, work for, and trust God for. Our flesh prefers pride. The devil prefers pride, and the world prefers pride. But our spirit, our new man, who has been born again by God's spirit, knows the value of humility. And sometimes, just sometimes, the world takes note. Sometimes the Holy Spirit uses our true humility to convict the unbeliever in light of a, and, and then light a spark that brings them to Jesus in faith and repentance, humbling themselves also so that we all together are raised up by Christ and with Christ. We say this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The service continues on page 18. O Lord, our governor, whose glory is in all the world, we commend this nation to thy merciful care, that being guided by thy providence, we may dwell secure in thy peace. Grant to the President of the United States and to all in authority wisdom and strength to know and do thy will. Fill them with the love of truth and righteousness, and make them ever mindful of their calling to serve this people in thy fear, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom cometh every good and perfect gift, Send down upon our bishops and other clergy, and upon the congregations committed to their charge, the healthful spirit of thy grace, and that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our advocate and mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. O God, the creator and preserver of all mankind, we humbly beseech thee for all sorts and conditions of men, that thou wouldest be pleased to make thy ways known unto them, thy saving health unto all nations. More especially, we pray for thy holy church universal, that it may be so guided and governed by thy good spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth, and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace, and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to thy fatherly goodness all those who are in any ways afflicted or distressed, in mind, body, or estate. 
that it may please thee to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. And this we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise not only with our lips but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, who hast given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and dost promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Our concluding hymn is number 152. All praise to thee who safe hast kept and hast refreshed me while I slept. Grant, Lord, when I from death shall wake, I may of endless life partake. Lord, I my vows to Thee renew, Disperse my sins as morning dew. God, my first springs of thought and will, And with Thyself my spirit fill. Direct control suggest this day, all I design or do or say, that all my powers with all their might in thy soul glory may unite. Praise God from whom all blessings flow, praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Let us go forth in joy to love and serve the Lord.